it felt like Washington itself might become like Berlin during the Cold War, surrounded by enemies and perhaps even fall to them. So it was, it was, a, it was a harrowing moment in the city's history and uh, that, is, that is the backdrop to the story. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV. Today we're talking with John J. Miller, author of the historical novel, The First Assassin. Uh, give us the one sentence uh, uh, summary. It's a historical novel, takes place in 1861 Washington about an assassin who has been hired to murder President Lincoln. Okay, and can you tell us who did it? Or should we read the book? You can read the book, although the assassin is uh, identified early on and we follow him around the city. Okay. Uh, what drew you to this material? I'm a Civil War buff. I've grown up reading this stuff. I enjoy that era of our history. I'm also a fan of thrillers. Uh, they're great pieces of entertainment. They tell great stories. And uh, I had the idea of combining the two. And, 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 and for years, I had the notion of, of, of this particular idea. Now, you have, uh, I mean, you're a well-established, well-known journalist. Uh, hopefully, not much fiction in your journalism. But what, uh, you know, why did you decide to become a novelist? I'm, I'm an English major. Right. Uh, uh, and my inner English major has always wanted to write fiction. Now, of course, I, I write nonfiction professionally. That's what I do for a living. But this has been a goal of mine for many, many years. And um, I started working on this book 13 years ago, and, and it was the project I kept putting aside when, when uh, uh, paychecks uh, or opportunities for them would come along or children were born. But, but this, uh, this was always there in the background. Uh, what was the strangest thing that you learned about mid-century, mid-19th century D.C.? It was a really... Because this, this is a rich book. I mean, it really goes through what it's like to be in that time and place. Well, I tried to make it as historically accurate as possible. A lot of research went into the book to make the city come alive so that readers would understand uh, what it was like with the unpaved streets, the unfinished Capitol Dome, uh, what Washington was like in that era. But the most interesting thing that, 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 that then provides the backdrop for the book is how harrowing it would have been to have lived in this city in 1861 when the country was being torn apart, when there were rumors of conspiracies about bombing the Capitol, about murdering Lincoln, fears that the Virginia militia would come across the river and take over the city. Uh, because there weren't enough federal troops here to defend it. And there were, there were several months when Fort Sumter was falling, when um, it, it felt like Washington itself might become like Berlin during the Cold War, surrounded by enemies and perhaps even fall to them. So it was, it was, a, it was a harrowing moment in the city's history, and uh, that, is, that is the backdrop to the story. Talk a little bit. Lincoln is you know, clearly the great mythopoetic figure in American history. Um, we, we, keep moving back towards him or speak through him. Some people love him, some people hate him. Uh, what's your basic take on Lincoln, and why do you think he has such a, a vast hold, a, a tight grip on our imagination? Well, he is obviously the central figure in the great drama of our national life. And uh, he's a complicated man. He's a great character with a great story. And, and there are many, many opinions about him. I personally admire him. I view him as a champion of human freedom. Let's not forget what one of his great accomplishments was, ending slavery. Uh, and he kept the Union together. Who knows what North America would be like today if, 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 if that effort had failed. Uh, there are criticisms of him. Anybody's flawed. I can make them myself, but I think... Uh, he had that uh, mole. There's that, annoying. yeah. yeah. Funny-looking guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he looks like a caricature. Uh, so he's, he's, he's fascinating to write about. But, uh, um, but I count myself as an admirer, and, and he, is a, he is a figure in the book. Um, talk a little bit about how you're publishing this. This is an interesting experiment in do-it-yourself culture. Exactly. I, uh, my, 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 my original approach was to sell it to a mainstream New York publisher. I've done that before. And when I finished the manuscript, I gave it to my agent in New York. He's a very good agent who has sold books for me to Doubleday, to HarperCollins, and so forth, nonfiction books. And I asked him to sell this one. Well, he tried, and he couldn't. And it turns out that uh, first-time novelists have a hard time getting contracts, especially when the economy is as bad as it is. There just wasn't anybody willing to take a chance. So last spring, I was considering my options. I had not completely exhausted them in that field. But I thought to myself, you know, I really do I want to spend another six months or a year struggling and possibly failing, or do I want to try something else? So I started looking into self-publishing, and, and I realized that Self-publishing is not what it used to be, or at least my mental image of what it used to be, which is little old ladies who write books of bad poetry that nobody wants to read. 
it's actually a new entrepreneurial business that, that online resources have, have, have made available. So I, I, I partnered with a company called CreateSpace, which is a subsidiary of Amazon, and it's a print-on-demand service. You basically upload your PDF file, and when someone buys a copy of the book, they will mail it to them. And it is, I mean, one of the things that it, we were talking about this, it's, I mean, it's incredibly well-designed and well put together. So it's not, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, this isn't real, but it's, I mean, this looks as good as any book that you're going to find. Well, thank you, and that was one of my goals. I said, if I'm going to do this, I don't want it to look homemade. What are your uh, What are your goals? Do you have sales goals or review goals or anything like that? Well, my original goal was to have you know the million copy lay down on the front table of Borders to yep. be on Oprah and all right. that stuff, and uh, um, that's still there in the right. back of my head. But right, my 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 immediate goal when I was reassessing last spring was just to get the book out, mm -hmm. to let people enjoy it. Right. Um, and, 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 that, and then now to go into a phase where I try and tell as many people as possible about it. I think it's a good book that a lot of people will like. Well, uh, well the kind of publishing institutions, things like uh, bookstores, would they buy copies or Publishers Weekly, will they comment on it and things like that? It's or, all possible, yeah. and, uh, but as you can imagine, there's, 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 a, there's a bias built right, in right. against this yeah. kind of thing, and it's a reasonable bias. Yeah. I get it. They, yeah. they, they trust mainstream publishers to serve right. as gatekeepers. Right. Uh, um, so I need to overcome some of that, yeah. and and I'm trying to and trying to explain to people that 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 there are old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things. Now this is I mean it's, and, uh, let's close with a brief discussion of uh, politics. Uh, you write for National Review, the Wall Street Journal. You're from the conservative end of things. You're doing something very innovative here. Do the conservatives in the country need to start innovating and trying to start new things? Well, I'm an advocate of entrepreneurship, of free markets, and so forth. And Nick, I'm a conservative, but as you know, when conservatives gather, I'm, off, I'm often the most libertarian guy in the room. Um, this, is, this is a great entrepreneurial venture. I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. I hope it succeeds. And, do you, what, what is, what's the one thing that conservatives need to do to get back some kind of ideological or electo electoral mojo? I think what they did in Virginia is, is a good example. Have a good candidate with a good message that applies uh, conservative principles to the problems of right now, whether they are uh, uh, fiscal sanity or, or transportation issues. Think about conservative solutions, which are often free market solutions right. to our public policy dilemmas. Well, I know at Reason we're uh, excited about him selling off the uh, state-owned liquor stores, the uh, last bastion of socialism right, exactly. in, in the Old Dominion. What's your next project? Well, I'm at work on another book right now. It, it is a piece of nonfiction that's going to involve um, um, history and sports and politics. And I'm also still working for National Review and writing for the Wall Street Journal and, and trying to keep as busy as possible. I want to thank John J. Miller for talking to us today about his historical novel, The First Assassin. Thanks for coming in, John. Thanks, Nick.